This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi, he is an 8-year-old gentleman with a brown nuclear cataract and a pupil which is moderately dilating. The nucleus is very dense and that's the challenge while dealing with such cases. Apart from the dense nucleus, there's another challenge to deal with. I'm concerned about these calcified specks which are slightly in the paracentral or near the equator of the capsule. And this is a cause for concern. I'm worried whether the capsulotomy will be intact and how am I going to do the rexis in such situations. If I can get the rexis all right, uh, dealing with this hard nucleus is not going to be a major issue. Let's see how things turn out. 1 ml of lignocaine is being injected in the inferior medial canthus using a 26G needle in the subtenant space. This is just to augment the topical anesthesia. The two side ports are being created. There is some amount of conjunctival chemosis. This is primarily because of the 1 ml of lignocaine which is given intended to be in the subtenant space. 0.1 ml of intracameral dilating agent along with the local anesthetic is used and I'm hoping that the pupil size improves. Tripan blue is used to stain the capsule. In the meantime, I'm bending the capsule autumn needle so that gives enough time to stain the capsule. BSS is used to irrigate out the dye. And now is the time to inject OVD. I'm using dispersive OVD containing chondritin sulfate to pressurize the chamber and also to coat the endothelium. After the injection of OVD, the pupil size has increased. I think a major relief for me. The plan of using a pupil expansion device is suspended as of now. I'm intentionally planning a scleroconial incision here. Scleral groove is created through the conjunctiva about 1 to 1.5 mm posterior to limbus. And then I'm using a 2.8 mm sharp keratome to first create a small scleroconial tunnel before entering into the antechamber about 1 mm anterior to the limbus. So the idea of creating this scleroconial tunnel in this case is that the extent of wound burn is going to be minimal. If at all, it's going to happen, although it's rare when we're using torsional energy. The second possible help this would provide me is that in the worst case scenario, if I have to convert into a manual small chain cataract surgery, but I can just use the scleroconial incision to create a scleral tunnel on either side and deal with the situation. The initial transconjunctival cut is slightly longer than the 2.8 mm incision. This ensures that I don't have any conjunctival chemosis uh, during the phacomulsification process. The only question which is ringing in my head at this point is, I don't know what is the status of the zonules in this case. And the moment I touch the capsule with my needle, I'll be getting an idea of the zonules. And that is really going to indicate the prognosis or the ease of doing surgery in this eye. So I'm very anxious to know about it and using a 26G needle I make the initial puncture and uh, to my relief it looks like the zonules are quite healthy. I did not see any wrinkling of the anti-capsule. Well this suggests that the zonules are in good health. My plan is to ensure that the rexus is done around and slightly away from the calcified zone. I want to avoid it. So my goal is to do the rexus in such a way that it is encompassing or it is around and away from uh, the calcified zone. So let's see how it turns out. Thankfully, the difficult part of the rexus was uneventful. I'm consciously attempting to have a slightly bigger rexus of about 5 mm or 5.5 mm so that the nucleus division process during emulsification is going to be less stressful on the rexus margin as well as on the bag. Gentle hydrodissection using very little amount of fluid is used to do the step and quick decompression ensures that the fluid is let off and I'm just confirming the mobility and rotation of the nucleus. Time to emulsify the nucleus. The strategy which I'm going to follow is using scalp setting to create a central deep trench of about 80% and then perform vertical chop to divide the nucleus into at least six smaller fragments and then switch to the quadrant settings to emulsify each of these fragments. As a rule, uh, before starting the FACO power, I just use the epinucleus settings just to ensure that the flow is done and without using any FACO power, I'm just aspirating the superficial cortex and also the OVD just to make sure that the flow is on and the BSS is flowing through. These are the scalp settings which I'm using for this density of nucleus. 
I'm using a sharp chopper to deal with this dense nucleus and also please note that the exposed part of the tip is slightly longer. I consciously use this when I'm dealing with a harder nucleus. The idea is it gives a longer tip length for me to bury quite deep into the substance of the nucleus. The nucleus is stabilized with the chopper as I'm sculpting down. The sculpting length is very small. It's just about say 2.5 to 3 millimeter and this trench is going to be dug deeper at least about 80% depth. The idea is we want to have a very deep and a firm grip at the core of the nucleus. That's the reason I would want to sculpt down deep. So once I feel that the depth is good enough, I'm going to change the settings to chop mode. And these are the settings. I'm going to bury the FACO tip until the exposed part of the tip is submerged into the substance of the nucleus. The chopper goes down vertically and then the lateral separation movements are done. The chopper is subsequently placed at deeper planes. The first is lateral separation maneuver, second and third. Progressively it is placed at a deeper plane to ensure that the crack is got at the posterior plate. A small portion of the central posterior plate is still holding it together, although the distal half of the hemineucleus is separated well. In such dense nucleus, it's expected that the posterior plate is going to be very tough and you need to have multiple lateral separation maneuvers at progressively deeper planes to crack it without stretching at the excess margin or putting stress on the zonules. The hemineucleus is then subsequently chopped to give three fragments. Please note the point that the tip is buried at a slightly deeper plane and also sufficiently long enough so that the most of the exposed part of the tip is buried into the nucleus. This is the key step. Holding it quite deep in the substance of the nucleus and also budding the tip sufficiently long enough. This gives us very strong grip for us to crack the nucleus effortlessly. If we can hold the nucleus much more posterior in the central part with sufficiently a long tip, then we're not going to get chalk and uh, this firm grip is going to ensure that the division is going to be much more effortless. Similar division methods are employed in the second hemineucleus. The tip is buried deep into the substance of the nucleus, chopper goes down and the lateral separation maneuver. As three fragments are created in the second hemineucleus as well, time to deal with each of these fragments. The first fragment is pulled out of the bag and then the emulsification is begin. Settings are changed here. The main change would be in the type of energy which we are using. Now I am switched over to a purely torsional energy with the IP on setting. During emulsification of the fragments, two things are critical to prevent endothelial cell trauma. Number one would be posterior plane of emulsification and second would be to ensure that the fragments don't jump around and hit the conendothelium. To achieve that, I ensure that my chopper is slightly above the FACO tip and it's acting like a shield preventing these fragments from coming out of the area and bombarding against the endothelium. Half of the hemineucleus is out and time to refill the antechamber with viscoelastic. First, the dispersive OVD goes in, coating the endothelium and below it, I'm going to put in uh, HPMC in the vicinity of the capsular bag where actually the emulsification process happens. The final three fragments are being emulsified. The principles are going to be the same. We're going to try to emulsify them in a posterior plane that is at the level of the pupillary margin and I'm going to use the chopper as a shield to prevent the fragments from jumping away from the pupillary zone and coming near the cornea. Uh, by following these two principles, we can ensure that the cornea in the next post-op day is going to be very clear and even the long-term damage to the endothelium is going to be very minimal. The epinucleus needs to be removed now and it is just sticking onto the posterior capsule. So I come out, I go in with the BSS cannula, depress the posterior lip and then inject some BSS so that it 
the epinucleus is maneuvered away from the posterior capsule and it folds on its own. Now it's easier for us to evacuate it. The moment the eye becomes soft, the pupil comes down in size and it's a little bit of a concern but as soon as I inject viscoelastic, with the pressure itself, the pupil again expands giving me better visualization. Very little cortex is there which is aspirated out. The post capsule is polished using the jet of BSS. Time to implant the lens. The multi-piece hydrophobic lens is implanted into the bag under the cover of uh, viscoelastic. Once the proximal haptic is also dialed into the bag, time to remove the OVD both in front and behind the lens. The side ports and the main incisions are hydrated. At the end of the surgery, uh, we can see the total amount of uh, FACO energy which is consumed and it, this is a screenshot. That's it, the case is done. These are the first day post-op pictures and the cornea is very clear and patient is quite happy with the visual outcome. So the message here is, in spite of having a very dense uh, cataract, uh, using proper strategies, we can achieve clear corneas in the first post-op day in majority of the cases if you follow certain basic fundamental uh, principles. The most challenging aspect of a surgery in such cases would be dependent mostly on the health of zonules. If the zonules are healthy as was in this case, dealing with the dense nucleus itself is not going to be a major issue at all. The situation would have been much more challenging if the zonules were weak then the surgery definitely would have taken a longer time and also I would have to be much more slower and changed my strategy a little bit. What did I do unique in this case was I used a scleral incision. It's actually not very mandatory for people who are using a torsional energy because torsional energy does not cause any wound burn. But if a surgeon who is using a conventional longitudinal energy FACO machine, then wound burn is one of the most common associations when you're dealing with such cataracts. And for them, I think switching on to a scleral incision is going to be beneficial in some ways. Other than that, the standard principles of using good quality OVD using posterior plane of emulsification and ensuring that the fragments don't hit the endothelium. If we follow these three principles, then most often than not, you find the corneas are going to be clear the first post-op day. Thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful.